Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining and a big welcome to this, the third BCT webinar of 2022. My, how the year has flown. My name is Joel Stibbard and I'm an ecologist in the education team here at the BCT or the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. In my role, I have the pleasure of not only informing landholders and the public of the values of private land conservation, but also to help build a conservation community within which we can all learn new ways to understand and protect our natural world. The webinar today provides a means for us to do just that, so thanks again for being here. Now, before we get started, as always, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're all meeting today, recognising their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. I'm here again on beautiful Wobbegal country, aka Newcastle, and I know we have people calling in from right across New South Wales and possibly even further afield. I pay my ultimate respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us today. G'day. And this webinar is all about protecting and restoring the Australian landscapes, much revered by our First Nations people, yet sadly exploited since European arrival. It's not just an Australian problem. Worldwide, exploitation of landscapes has seen massive declines in biodiversity and ecosystem failure. So much so that it puts our own future at risk. This has been recognised by the United Nations, who have declared this the decade of ecosystem restoration. As the old saying goes, the best time to start was yesterday, the next best time is now. So to talk all things restoration right now, we have Joe Desman, a valued member of the BCT's technical team, who will talk us through the BCT restoration guidelines. And we have Andrew Knope, a BCT landholder with two agreements near Dubbo. Andrew's coming to the Dubbo office today, so very much uh, appreciate the efforts, mate. Thank you. Andrew's going to show us the amazing results of the work he has done on his properties over the last two decades, utilising the same principles promoted in our guideline. Look, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and after seeing Andrew's presentation, I can tell you that the pudding is tasty. Following the presentations, we'll have Q&A as always with both Joe and Andrew. There's a chat window on the side of your screen Pop any questions you have in there and we'll do our best to get them answered. Look, so much to get through and I reckon we might have plenty of questions today. So let's get straight to it. Joe, please enlighten us on the BCT guidelines and how they might apply for agreement holders watching today. Take it away, Joe. Thanks for that introduction, Joel. Um, hi everyone. My name is Joe Desmond and I work for the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. So in my role, I get to work um, in the agreements and technical services team and I see the final agreements. I also assist with the preparation of technical guidance that all these agreements use when it comes to their management actions. And this includes the BCT Restoring Native Vegetation Guidelines for Assisted Regeneration and Revegetation. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the BCT Restoring Native Vegetation Guidelines before you get a taste of restoration in action with Andrew that he's put into practice on his properties. This is to give you an introduction to the core ideas behind the guide. So the guidelines help you to choose the best approach when planning any restoration or revegetation on your property, and we encourage you to have a look at these detailed guidelines. They are available on our website under Resources tab, and then Guidelines on Land Management for Conservation. So I assume you're here today because you're interested in improving the vegetation and ecological values on your property. Before you begin, there's a few things to consider to help you choose the best options for your property. So when thinking about this, let's look at this simple diagram and it's looking at the biological resilience of your site against the level of restoration action needed. In general, the higher the resilience, the less intervention is necessary or alternatively, the greater the level of degradation, the more investment and effort it will take to restore the vegetation. The resilience and restoration spectrum introduces the three different approaches to restoring native vegetation. And the level of resilience on your site will influence the best approach to any restoration actions that you wanna put in place. It's important to note that not all BCT agreements have native restoration actions within the agreement and this is because most agreements already contain intact or highly resilient vegetation. So this means that they're best suited to the natural regeneration or assisted regeneration approaches rather than revegetation. 
If you currently have these actions in your agreement or you don't, you may be considering about how to best put them into practice. Let's have a look at natural regeneration. So natural regeneration is letting your property rest. It's where plants grow unassisted from the seed and the soil seed bank, and it's best suited to highly resilient sites where seed stock is intact. There are a few threats present, such as weeds or grazing. Other characteristics of a resilient site include the dominance of native grasses and ground cover and relatively low weed cover. Other signs of resilience can include the presence of old remnant trees, and regrowth, such as saplings or shrubs. So in this situation, the site is intact. It's an open woodland community, naturally sparse and shrubs, and it has no threats such as weeds or grazing affecting the species present. The species can germinate from the soil seed bank when seasonal conditions are favorable. So most BCT agreements will have areas of vegetation that are best suited to natural regeneration, as all the agreements have a high standard of biodiversity values present. Other characteristics of where natural regeneration is the best approach is where the ground story has a high diversity of flowers and grasses. And these species are the tasty morsels that are the sum of the first to go when there's grazing. So in this slide, we have some Swansona uh, recta, Diarus orchid, some more Swansona cerisia, and a Murnong daisy, Microceris lanceolata. It's a really nice sight. So now let's look at when assisted regeneration is the best approach. Assisted regeneration allows natural regeneration by removing threats such as grazing or dominant weeds, which are outcompeting natives, or alternatively, providing a trigger such as soil disturbance or fire. This is best suited for sites with moderate to high resilience where the seed stock is largely intact. So at this site, assisted regeneration is the preferred approach. The woodland vegetation strata layers are all intact. There are several weeds present that are outcompeting the lower strata. So in this particular season, it was a wet, warm year after an extended dry. It was a really good year for Patterson's curse and thistles. The actions to restore native vegetation would be weed management and perhaps the introduction of a natural fire regime to stimulate the soil seed bank. Now let's look at revegetation. This is the most intense restoration action and requires planting tube stock or direct seeding to sites with low resilience. It's best used where the seed stock is depleted or absent or where competition with weeds is preventing natural regeneration. Signs of low resilience include high presence of weeds or the dominance of introduced pastures in the ground layer. So there's usually minimal regrowth, a few living trees, there might be some paddock trees um, and there are usually other issues um, present as well, like land degradation, soil erosion. So this particular site has been grazed to an extent that there are species absent from all the different strata layers. There are some palatable grass species present, but the majority are less palatable. There are forbs and wildflowers have been foraged out of the system. Um, and the regeneration of the canopy is being suppressed by the grazing. So this community is naturally sparse in shrubs, but the shrubs are absent due to the grazing as well. The site has not been cultivated or pasture improved, and this is really promising. So with careful planning, and a good, it is a good candidate for revegetation. We can see in the bottom right hand picture, um, revegetation planting has been fenced off and protected from grazing. Uh, and you can see that these have still got their tree guards on. So it's a good reminder that these need to be removed once the trees are established. So we have to remember that for revegetation to be successful, it requires a lot of planning and effort. You need to know the seasonal changes of your site to choose the best time to plant and to plan well in advance. Have a look at the seasonal vegetation changes on your property, and then you'll know what's in the seed bank. Um, this is a good example of, the, this is the same site in different seasons. So the top image, is the site in autumn, while the below image shows the site in spring and the seed bank in the same year. 
you can see the vegetation has responded to a really good growth season and a lot of weeds have come up. So it's important to choose the appropriate species to plant as well, based on the values you're trying to restore. Ideally, you'd like species that are locally sourced so they have the same provenance. And this means they're acclimatized to the local area and have similar genetics. It's best achieved by propagating from seed on your own property or perhaps from a neighbor's property if you have their permission. Another really good option is to contact your local native nursery. Be aware that it's really normal to plan over a year in advance to propagate seedlings or collect mature seed that's suitable for direct seeding. So there are a lot of risks with revegetation. These two sites here show seedlings um, that were planted but not have that have not survived well. So on the left, despite fencing the planting area, stock have been able to come in and they've munched the saplings, pulled them out or trampled them. So shut the gate, mate. And on the right hand side, we have a large population of rabbits, um, which the landholder was aware of. And so the approach had been to infuse the weed mats with pindone poison to deter the rabbits predating them but it really wasn't effective enough. And so in retrospect, rabbit control prior to planting was certainly needed. There's also the alternate risk of overplanting seedlings when you're trying to account for high mortality. And this can just result in overcrowding of trees so they can't grow properly. So it does require a lot of thought and planning. Particularly given the current financial situation where there's ever increasing costs for materials, seedlings, fuel and herbicide, um, you really want to carefully plan it out so you're not wasting your time and effort. So the most important message that I want you to take home is that when you're taking on any native vegetation restoration at your site, you really want to choose the best approach based on the site needs. So the BCT guidelines on native vegetation restoration outline key principles to help you plan restoration efforts on your property. And by ensuring you look, eat, that each of these principles are considered, it will mean you have a greater chance of success. So let's just run through those eight principles. You want to mitigate threats causing degradation. These could be weeds or pests. You want to base your management decision on the level of resilience at your site that we talked about. So this often means that you'd be looking at assisted regeneration over revegetation. Have clear objectives for the ecological values you're trying to achieve, whether it's to reintroduce species or improve cover. Exclude or manage livestock from restoration areas. Want to use locally indigenous or climate ready plant species. Aim for complexity in the vegetation structure using a diversity of species. Base your decisions on the best available signs and seek advice where you need. So finally, manage the risk of failure through careful planning, clear objectives, measurable targets and adequate site preparation and ensure you have ongoing maintenance and monitoring. So there is a BCT revegetation plan template and these will help you plan those out. So uh, restoring nat native vegetation is really positive action for the ecological health of your property and the environment. So I'm sure you're asking, can I do it in my agreement area? And the answer is it depends on your agreement. We encourage you to look at your own agreement as the first point of call. Restoration may not specifically be in your management plan. And if restoration is enabled in your agreement, or if it is in the future, it must be done in accordance with our guidelines. So do talk to the BCT, your local BCT contacts, where you see any merit in this approach. Um, also re a reminder that depending on where and what native seed you're collecting, you'll, either, you'll need permission from the landowner and potentially a license if you're collecting threatened species. The BCT encourages, is encouraging of positive improvements to biodiversity and would love to help you on this journey. So there are plenty of opportunities for those with conservation partnership program agreements to access grant funding for appropriately planned and executed restoration actions. And there's also opportunities for grant funding with local land services and land care too that may be compatible with your agreement. So do reach out to your local BCT landholder support officer if you'd like to know more. 
And finally, I want to leave you with a bunch of resources. There's plenty on the internet. Um, and these are just a few key publications that I think you'll find useful to refer to. Also have a look at the BCT Restoration of Native Vegetation Guidelines, which includes a very extensive reference list to many more resources that you may find useful on your, on your journey. So thank you for your time. I hope you found that a little bit valuable. And now I'll pass back over to you, Joel. Thanks, Joe. Fantastic. Look, I know how much research and collaboration has gone into those guidelines. And so congrats to you and the team for bringing it all together. Um, just a quick one as well for everybody, like those references and other things, we'll provide the presentations. We'll have those available, uh, the, the presentations, yeah, the slide uh, presentations available for people if they want it after the fact. So you'll be able to look at it there. And of course, I should mention too, that we're recording this webinar. So if you watch it now and you want to watch it again later, it'll be available on the events page of our website. All right, so let's keep going. Remember, type in those questions in the Q&A, and I'll now hand over to Andrew Canope, one of our esteemed landholders who has taken the time to present for us today. As I say, he's come all the way into Dubbo. Um, Andrew and his wife, Jenny, are committed to the concept of country stewardship, aiming to restore resilient and vibrant ecosystems and landscapes. The presentation he has for us today will show just how successful Jenny and Andrew have been at this. So strap yourselves in. Anyway. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about the on-ground component of revegetation here in Wiradjuri country around Dubbo. Firstly, a couple of uh, additional resources available online. So the Australian Plant Society has a treasure trove of information, many photos, webinars, and YouTube videos. Their plant descriptions are excellent, answering all the important questions for everyone the what does a particular species look like what soils and climate tolerances do they have and sorry i've just got to find the clicker the local land services planting guide is also very good we are hosting a revegetation field day with land care and bct on the 24th of september next week at Narromine and we'll have folks for um, we'll have copies for folks to take home. So I'll start here with our first slide on our on our property. So Jenny and I love the Australian bush. We're restoring it everywhere we can. This essentially means building functional ecosystems. Ecosystems use the sun's energy and landscape resources and are self-replicating. They can regenerate, adapt, and evolve. To achieve a functional ecosystem, we aim to maximize biodiversity so we can have more pathways for energy and resources to cycle through the, through the landscape. We start with the plants and wildlife we already have, and then focus on what is needed to enhance the ecology. We have found this means looking beyond just a list of plant species. For wildlife and plants to flourish, a landscape also needs structural diversity, essentially a complex mix of plants, growth habits such as ground covers, sub shrubs, small and large trees and shrubs. It also needs physical structures that wildlife can use as potential home. This is our narrow mine property looking across three restored ecosystems, a river red gum forest, a floodplain kinopod shrubland and a mixed box woodland further on the horizon there. The starting base was a cleared paddock ecologists would call a derived grassland, basically a woodland cleared of trees and shrubs. The condition was poor to fair with common grazing resilient natives mixed with annual and perennial weeds. So you can see here a river red gum seedling planted and the Patterson's curse in the background. So we've had to spray out this um, seedling to keep the Patterson curse from basically over out competing it. Removing stock allowed the herbage to regenerate and planting the trees helped remove the excess nut, um, nutrients that were supporting the annual weeds. So 15 years later, it's a very different landscape. Weeds struggle, but native grasses and forbs and wetland species flourish. Woodland birds, mammals and reptiles are returning. 
Before you start revegetating, take some time to fully appreciate, appreciate what you already have. A diverse herb layer is a very difficult thing to replace. So avoid disturbing the soil and spraying tree lines if you have some hidden gems. A low disturbance planting technique suits this situation, but I'll speak more on that later. While you take the time to see what you have, take notes on soil and landscape variations. These generally require careful species selection. So the soil cracks on the left will tear um, tree, tree roots. So you have to be very careful about what species can tolerate that. So weeping mile is one and other species that grow on self-mulching cracking verticels. Also, the um, water logging is a feature. If that is around for more than a few months, it can have an adverse effect on some plants. So you have to be careful with what species to use there. These variations, the soils and the water logging and rocky outcrops and various things provide a diverse living, outcro um, living canvas for you to, to, to base your restoration. We use the roly-poly and galvanised burr in the derived grassland as a protective nursery for our seedlings and seed. This returned a small patch of Western Kenopod shrubland to Mearbone, which features eight varieties of edible salt bushes, which also have indigenous cultural significance. Sorry, the lights have gone out. <laughs> few technical issues here. Wildlife love la diverse landscapes, open spaces with the opportunity to shelter and forage in dense foliage. So this is our mixed box grassy woodland uh, and shrubby woodland. As you can see, we've scattered, um, have copses of trees with scattered individuals and plenty of room for the grass to remain so that woodland birds can use that. Wildlife rely on nature to provide them home for resources or resources for their homes. Diverse patchwork landscapes with tall perennial ground covers encourages insectivorous woodland birds, whilst dis discouraging aggressive species such as the noisy, noisy miner. John Oxley, the first explorer to venture into the Western Slopes and Plains, recorded observations which can, can assist today's landscape manager. He observed, the ground being absolutely covered with a case of various species, some extremely beautiful. We proceeded on our course, which led us through nine or 10 miles through what might be termed an opus forest country with respect to the timber growing on it, but it was overrun with mimosa and acacia bushes many of which were coming into flower, relieving in some measure the sombre foliage of the cypress and box trees which were scattered among them. These observations are an indicator of a landscape reliant on symbiotic relationships to drive ecological productivity and resilience. Relationships which we now know link vascular plants with soil bacteria in a mutualistic arrangement of shared nutrients, moisture and carbohydrates. The pea family have highly evolved relationships which fix huge quantities of atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. This nitrogen is fundamental to the ecological health of many of our landscapes. Fungi and other bryophytes are major players in the nutrient cycle. Importantly, they can synthesize compounds and break down minerals, which are then made available to the whole ecosystem. A plant that has formed a mycorrhizal partnership with truffles or puffball fungi can access moisture and nutrients a thousand times more efficiently. Soil bacteria and mycorrhiza are landscape game changers. So why are we losing them? The simple answer is the combination of overgrazing with soil trampling and compact, compaction. Here we see on the left, 
the impact of feral goats. This is off our property before we had eradicated them. And their impact was, was quite staggering, to be honest. After eradication, you can see the Lahard and Berger coming through here. And um, there's a dead goat. That was, I didn't actually place that in picture. It was there and I just thought that's a great picture. I've got to take that. And it's just such a, an indication of what's happened now because of, uh, it took us about a couple of years to get rid of the goats. And um, now everything was coming back. These are the impacts of grazing and trampling. So here we see the stages of overgrazing, minor grazing on the top left. This is relatively sustainable and the plants retain leaf and the capacity to flower and reproduce. You can see there cut, um, each branch has been trimmed and um, a bit like uh, it's been clipped, but it's relatively sustainable. On the right hand side though, the grazing impact is now escalating and causing significant structural damage to the entire plant. The uh, one in the left hand bottom corner, overgrazing has resulted in the early demise of a perennial plant along with substantial landscape degradation in terms of the soil trampling and camp compaction. The final blow to any landscape is cultivation. Widespread cultivation destroys mycorrhizal hyphae, organic matter, and leads to soil erosion and compaction. A few planting tips, and back to the fun stuff. If you have some seedlings where the leaf mass is too large for the root ball, such as the top right hand corner there, rebalance by pruning the youngest foliage. This will significantly reduce plant moisture requirements and help to to focus on root growth. A lot of people don't realise that that they, um, if you plant a tree that's as large as it is on the top left right hand corner there, it will immediately go into stress as it as the roots try to get moisture from the soil. So reducing its transpiration rate effectively does that before you put it into the ground. Also planting the seedling very deep into the soil. Plant it deep into a moist soil profile. Don't put it plant into dry soil. If you do, you're going to have to water immediately. And don't be concerned if the we uh, if the leaves go under the soil and are buried. So here's the soil surface at that line, and the root ball is several inches underneath, with several inches of insulation on top of this, on top of the root ball to help it keep moist and help the roots get established. This is our Dubbo property called Model Car. It has a good condition to derived grassland, so cultivation is out. Instead, we spot plant using the Aussie Hamilton tree plant. To a good moist dividus plant, let's get a bit whoop. back in the dark again. Spot seeding uses the same process, but this time aerates the, we aerate the soil to help root establishment. You can also broadcast the seed directly into the grassland. However, this will use a lot more seed, which is not viable if you are purchasing it. We use the broadcast method a lot as it is easy for us to collect and then spread the new seed into new areas. So a bit like a translocation project. Some results. So our properties at, at Narrow Mine, we've been working with our neighbours and we have, this is the neighbour's property here it had one remnant tree on it and an avenue of trees that had been planted up the driveway. So there's no, the trees that you see there are actually on the road. And we've put in some 
canes to help us find the seedlings again to do monitoring and picture from last couple of weeks ago is that's what it looks like now so you're basically seeing the trees are established we've got a really big buffer now between the the road and the house and the neighbors are getting a wonderful visual screen and break and we're putting in all local native diver, um, biodiversity that's me back in the day and um, again so there's the neighbors avenue of trees quite young at the time and our paddock has absolutely no trees in it so the neighbours, the shed at the back there, you can see is a line of wilgers which are planted on the neighbours and we've got nothing in there. And today it looks like this. So we've got a diversity of structure there. We've got um, lots of different wattles, um, kenopods, atroplex and eucalypts and lots of native grass. This is um, model car again, just taking that picture and blowing it up a bit there and we're having a look at some results. So this is a 70 hectare derived grassland and we're basically putting back scattered copses of trees with shrubs. And we can see that from, these are different spots on the property, all related, all around that Currajong tree, which is the remnant tree in the paddock left so people could get um, some forage cut cut the um courage on for forage and also for shade in the for stock so there's some of our results one of the things we're doing is a finishing touch with our tree planting of copses and, and scattered plants is we noticed that um, lizards were like really enjoying our firewood stack so we started enhancing our revegetation sites with strategically placed log piles. We use native plant thinnings or storm fallen timber, which we need to remove and put in a more useful spot. The stacks create surrogate hollows between the timbers. And as you can see, they work really well. There's a little common to tell her that we um, find in our wood stacks quite common commonly and um, many other lizards. If you have antichinus and dunnarts, they will love those as well. So they love the wood stacks, being able to get in there and be, have a safe shelter. Our Dubbo property, Monocar, has areas struggling with native, native cypress pine regrowth. So we use this as a habitat resources for both, resource for both properties. It creates a great resource, which I view as a landscape asset rather than a liability. And as you can see there, once the um, timber's been felled, um, you leave it on the ground and basically it creates a surrogate um, woody debris layer, which lizards and anticonists just love. Um, they can hunt now without, with a lot less um, feral animal pressure from cats and foxes. It's very difficult for a fox or a cat to actually hunt in that environment. And we also get sequestration for carbon because the, the, new, the existing plants will grow much quicker and the remaining plants, sorry. And the, um, the debris on the ground lasts for probably anything up to a decade. These managed areas, once they, um, you can see the old thinning there, um, with the stumps of the cypress and the cypress left in situ. That creates an amazing protective nursery for, um, for the plants to regenerate. We're getting lots of the wattle coming through. We're getting the hard and berger coming back. And basically, um, we also have habitat on the ground. So what is the result of about 15 years of doing this type of work. Oops, sorry. The grey box. Um, thinning of 
of eucalypts doesn't give you the, the kill results you'll get with cypress pine. So basically you'll get a coppice regrowth, regrowth and that in itself can be used as a surrogate habit, habitat to create um, a surrogate shrub layer. So now 10 years old, been thin 10 years ago. So we've got the fallen debris on the ground, great for the wildlife. We're getting some regeneration coming through, but the eucalypts are still quite dominant as a competitor. But we still have that shrub, um, surrogate shrub layer, it, and that is useful for the woodland birds. Landscape feedback. So one of the final issues we have um, is how are things going on your property? And we're finding that we are getting lots of natural regeneration from the plants that we have planted. And we're also getting ones of regeneration of plants that we haven't. And so we have on the left-hand side there, a rosewood tree. In the middle, a, a wilga, geigera, Parrot parviflora, and then a Myopora montana or the water bush or Bubiella. These are all coming up courtesy of the woodland birds who are bringing them back. And that's great because they're actually difficult plants to access from a nursery. So we, we see that as a real big tick in the box. It's increasing the diversity, it's all happening. And uh, however, we have all seen um, African box thorn and a couple of uh, green cestrum come through. So uh, it's a noxious weed. So you do have to keep an eye out for invasive species. So the woodland plants in our understory, this is, um, these are the indicators for us that are coming back through natural regeneration on our main larger property. And as you can see there, they're a wonder to behold. The spring is a, an amazing time and the La Nina summers can be an amazing time. You see in the bottom there, the swampy meadow um, floral display and the fairies aprons, they can last for months and months on end. It's a, a, it's a completely different landscape to the, what I see generally when I drive around. It's um, quite amazing. And, um, Just to get my paperwork in order here. I'm in someone's else office, uh, someone's office here in Dubbo with a laptop in front of me, in front of a lovely big screen, and it's a bit hard to handle. Um, to finish off, so I'd like to share with you a unique explorer's observation from Thomas Mitchell's journals. Across the Gubang Creek, 1835, April 13. The party moved off at half past eight o'clock and by half past nine, it crossed the Guban Creek or chain of ponds. This channel contains some deep pools, apparently proof against the summer's drought. In this and other tributaries of the same river, I observed that all permanent pools were surrounded by reeds. In 1848, Mitchell had caused to retrace his steps on an ambitious venture to find an overland route to the Gulf of Carpentaria. He followed the rivers and creeks which had previously assisted his expedition. The country he now traversed had fundamentally changed. He observes, 20th of December, 1848, Gubang Creek. Reaching a hill laid down on my former survey and from which I recognised Mount Laidley, I returned directly to the camp. We had encamped near those very springs mentioned as seen on my former journey, but instead of being limpid and surrounded by verdant grass as they had been then, they were now trodden by cat cattle into muddy holes, where the poor native had been endeavouring to protect a small portion from the cattle's feet and keep it pure by laying over it trees they had cut down for the purpose. The change produced in the aspect of this formerly happy secluded valley by the intrusion of the cattle and the white man was by no means favourable. And I could have easily conceived how I, had I been an nat Aboriginal native, should have felt and regretted that change. 
Over the next two weeks, Mitchell follows approximately 200 kilometres of central western riparian systems, including the Bogan River and various tributaries. All were similarly impacted by the early squatters' driving activities. As Mitchell neared the western limit of driving operations, he proclaims, we hope to find within the territory of the native ponds of clear water unsoiled by cattle. This is the Goobank Creek system in 2022. The chain of ponds and proof against drought, a distant memory. However, with good grazing management, some timber bed raising structures and restoration of suitable plants, these landscapes can be restored. So thank you everyone. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties and uh, back to you, Joel. Thanks, mate. Look, um, amazing. Sorry the lights kept going out on you there. <laughs> um, Dubbo off, I say. I'm a non-entity. Um, <laughs> look, that last slide in particular just really resonates as to the impact of what, you know, European, what's happened since European settlement in the last 200 plus years, doesn't it? But, I mean, congratulations to what you've been able to achieve since on your properties. Um, you know, it's there's some seriously important lessons to learn from your experiences and, you um, you know, along with what Jo has, has talked about in hers, you can really get, resonate as to how to apply those principles and, and what it means for restoration. All right, so look, let's just look, get into some of these questions. We've got a few coming in. Still probably got some time for some others. So please go ahead and do it. Um, first of all, I've, pardon me, I've got a question for Jo um, from Leslie. And she says, Jo mentioned fire and grazing management. Where can I go to get information on how this applies for my for my agreement? So fire and grazing management in particular. Uh -huh. Yeah, totally. A good question. Um, so basically the first point of call um, for any actions that are enabled in your agreement is is to look at your agreement. Um, so in your agreement, in the management plan, it'll outline the actions that are enabled for your agreement, whether they be livestock grazing or ecological burning. And if these are not in your agreement, but you see ecological merit, please do reach out to your local BCT contact. Um, also have a look at our website because the BCT has published guidelines on livestock grazing, as well as a guide for the application of fire as a management tool. So if you go to the BCT red website and navigate to the resources tab, and then navigate to land management for conservation, um, you'll find those guideline resources there, and these are relevant for all BCT agreements. Great. So Thanks, Joe. Light's gone on you again, Andrew. Um, <laughs> next one here we've got from Sharon. This is for you, Andrew. Does clipping the top of the seedling affect the final structure of the tree? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and um, if you're planting for forestry, purposes I guess you, you would try to avoid these things but then in reality when you're planting in a conservation area you're going to get browsing damage um, anyway um, so essentially you're just getting in first and cutting the top top growth layer out typically no not always um, sometimes it'll result in a what they call a double or triple leader um, but um, you're not cutting them off right at ground level so you're not cutting them back um, where they're losing all their growth tips. So no, not not really, but it could. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, that Andrew. answers it. Yep, nice one. Um, what else have we got here? From John, who asks, we, we saw some thinning on Andrew's photos. If revegetation work on my conservation site results in dense stands, am I allowed to thin them out? I think, Joe, we can throw that one at you as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, so again, it really depends on what's in your agreement. So if ecological thinning is an action that's enabled in your agreement, it'll be written in there. So have a look at what's in your agreement. Um, Revegetation re that's too dense, like that's very high risk. Um, so it does happen. Um, reach out to the BCT, your local BCT contact, and we can look at the merits of the approach. Um, also be aware that um, the BCT has published ecological thinning guidelines on our website again under um, land management conservation. 
um, and have a look at those because that would be relevant to every single agreement. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something that the BCT we've, we've strive to do is to provide guidance to landholders on a vast array of, of management actions. Um, still a few more to come, but yeah, those ones are, are there already. So it's a great resource. Um, who I else could, have we got here? I could, add, I could add to that, Joel, if that's yep. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so the, th the thinning that you saw on, on the slides, that was done under the NCT agreement. Um, where I had a clause written into the original contract and that dates back quite a long time ago. Um, and so, yeah, Tiffany has helped um, develop uh, fitting guidelines recently. And so the new, the new stuff that I did, which you could see there with the two dogs in it, um, that was done under Tiffany's new um, agreements, which was put into place just this year. Yeah, great. Year. And that Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, awesome. And that's that's actually something I was going to mention. And that that was that's actually for those um, paying attention. It was that's Tiffany Mason, the, the ecologist, who actually um, presented at the second webinar back in you know, a few months back. So, and that and that that's exactly the case. It's one of those things that if um, if revegetation works, or you know, if you think if you think thinning is warranted, it's much yeah, it's a case where you would talk to your local BCT rep, and um, we can sort of you know see what's appropriate for your agreement. Anyway, okay, excellent. Thank you. Moving on. Um, Peter Dixon asking, Andrew, are you getting any natural recruitment of seedlings from your mature planted overstory trees? I think you might have, I think you might have said that you've answered that, but elaborate a bit further if you will. Yeah, so we are, we are definitely getting um, quite a lot of regeneration coming through um, on all of everything. So, so you, you're looking at what you call the dominant canopy species. Um, the eucalypts are self-replicating. The um, understory is self-replicating. They they replicate a lot quicker because they have a. What you generally find with um, regeneration, if you have a large seed that comes uh, is created by the plant with a lot of endosperm, they typically can um, regenerate much more prolifically than say a eucalypt, which has a very tiny seed and basically needs a La Nina type of event or a wet period um, during the warm months to, to get it established. And then it has a, a long journey ahead of it, whether it'll actually survive. So um, basically, yeah, we're getting things of what we've planted, uh, uh, regeneration of plants that we've planted and plants that we haven't. If that answers the question, hopefully. Yep. I reckon so, mate. Thank you. That's great. Um, and there wasn't there was a small period there, Andrew, where you dropped out, but thankfully you came back. I thought we were gonna thought we were gonna lose it all there for a minute, but it was all good. Um, and I think at that point you were explaining your site preparation. So Sharon was asking if you could explain site preparation for seedling tube stock planting and direct seeding as you had dropped out at that time. Okay, yeah. Um, so the Scattered plantings, which we do to enhance the grassland, basically involve using a Hamilton tree planter, where you take a, a divot of soil out of the ground and you replace it with a seedling. You, pl you plant the seedling nice and deep into the soil um, to make sure that you know you, you get the, the root ball down into where the moisture is and will be retained for the longest period. And that's very important. So don't worry about leaves going under the ground. Um, that doesn't make a single bit of difference to the plant. So plant, plant the entire potting mix and several inches of the stem underground. You'll need a good sized seedling to do that. Um, and sometimes when you go to the nursery, you don't really know exactly what you're going to get when you've ordered plants. And so if they're very small, we would scalp a base and a soil away. That creates a, takes away the weed seed that's inside, is in the surface of the soil um we create that and then it creates a depression to accumulate water and then you plant the seedling the same way and so those two methods use very little soil disturbance so you if and um so you're not going to stimulate um weeds by sp spraying or cultivating in that manner you're just basically planting to what you have the survival rate is not as high as it would be if you did a, an obliteration of everything that's com um, competing in your landscape. Um, 
but you yeah the results is still pretty good it's 50 60 percent gone dark again <laughs> oh goodness energy someone's savers trying switch, eh? someone's trying to switch me off john <laughs> <laughs> yeah gong him yeah look excellent mate thank you um stephanie asks if you can provide it how much did it cost over the last 15 years for all the work andrew um look i i don't keep a spreadsheet um i have no interest in that side of things the cost uh, obviously if i was I, I will grow my own seedlings if i find that um you know that i need to uh, i collect my own seed um certainly if i was spending money on seed and and spreading it around the way i do I'd be a bit disappointed in how much money is, you know, because literally a kilo of seed is three or four hundred dollars. Um, I wouldn't do that. However, as I've been a seed collector for many years, um, and I used to sell seed commercially, one of the big bugbears for collecting seed is cleaning it and then packaging it and sending it off and all that type of thing. So it's a lot of on cost. Um, I just collect it in the, in the, in the landscape. And typically I'll spread it out the same day or a few days later, just take it to another area and just spread it around. That is basically just trying to get the proper gills into an area where they are not found. So um, as far as costing is concerned, what I do costs very, very little, but it costs time of which mm -hmm. that's what I'm devoted to. So I don't really worry about that too much. Hopefully that's an answer. Yeah, it so is. Unfortunately, mate. I don't have. I don't. I don't have a good spreadsheet. No. You could do well, one. It, it does. It does. It does lead into the next question. For, or another question here from Chrissy, who's asking if there's, um, if you know of any native seed collection training in in your region. She's asked about the Western region. I'm not aware of any, but do you do you know of uh, seed collection training um, that happens in and around your area or at all, Andrew? Once Greening Australia was established um, and, and had a strong regional um, place, they, they, would, they were doing things. Landcare occasionally do these things. Um, it had some, there's some OH&S issues nowadays in terms of using loppers and, and um, particularly big pole pruners where it's, um, I've demonstrated it to people, but as to giving them a go at it, um, I'd prefer them to do it on their own time um, because if you drop a branch on your head and you don't have the proper equipment, you, yeah, it's um, so I haven't seen one of those since the old Greening Australia days. I haven't seen one of those and they used to run them all the time. So Greening Australia would be the organisation to lobby, um, you know, your state member to say, look, Greening Australia used to be really active in our area. We want to see them. You know, we want to see them around and talk to your state member from um, the New South Wales and and uh, federal government, I'd say. Yeah, good call to arms there, mate. Thank you. Um, what have we got next? So Sharon asking, do you practice conservation grazing, Andrew, or is grazing excluded? If you do, what observations or comments can you make about the grazing rules in your agreement? So can you graze your, in your conservation agreement, Andrew? Um, no, I've excluded that from the property, and um, so that's it's very simple. There is no domestic stock available to be to be used or to be put yep. on the um, conservation area. I do have exclusion areas, um, so about eight or nine acres, which if in the future somebody owns the property, they could have a you know, keep a horse or something like that in there. The main reason I don't I wanted to go with total exclusion is um, on top of the feral animals. Um, also had a very um, well established kangaroo eastern grey problem. Um, it took many years to get them down to a, a, a number using tags and and um, professional shooters and my my own self. Um, I also have. Wallabies, the swamp and redneck wallaby. I have emus. I have a lot of grazing animals, so I don't really need any more in the picture. Um, there are no predators any um, in our landscape anymore. So uh, other than the wedge-tailed eagle, which um, means that there are no re 
limiting factors that are that could potentially naturally control a herbivore which now has free range of the landscape so the reality is if i throw any stock into that um, that's just that's going to exacerbate that problem and on top of that insects are a massive grazer of plants in native ecosystems and people just don't appreciate that I, so yeah um, but it, so yeah that's i don't graze okay well we we talked about grazing before and we we've talked about fire again uh, uh as well and this is another question so do you plan to burn andrew and we were speaking about it before we started weren't we about fire and so if you plan to burn and if so how will you decide when that's a great question Yes, so burning is an important uh, mitigation activity that I do around the infrastructure around the property. Um, and how do I decide to do it and when that is typically when it is safe to do so. Um, it is a very resource hungry activity in terms of if you to do a control burn, um, I've been involved with the RFS on some control burns that we've done for communities and you're literally looking at, I think there was 12 or 13 brigades involved, multiple trucks. Um, it was a, a logistic, a big logistics. And so as an individual, it's a much harder thing to do. And so I have to be very cautious about doing it. I do it during winter. I try and do it when it's rained and even when it's rained if I do it during during the day and the temperature starts to build a little bit even in winter and the wind gets into it in the grassland it'll take off explosively so it's a it's not an easy tool to use um, I don't use it in my derived grassland purely because the ground cover after three or two La Nina events is so prolific that a fire could easily get away and it would destroy my revegetation work, um, which some of those seedlings, I've, you know, I revegetate every year. So some of them are only quite small. Um, and mm. I'm, that's not a, I'm, yeah, to hate, <laughs> if I did it myself, I'd be kicking myself really hard in the butt. But um, the reality is if a, a natural fire comes through, then I'm just going to have to take it on the chin. Okay, no worries, mate. Thank you. It's a tricky space. It really is fire as, as more than anything else, I, I, I dare say. Um, yeah, so thanks for your insight, mate. One more, I think, for, from Rachel. Why does regen have to be done with natives only? In some cases, non-natives, I think, have a role to play as protection from weather. So, I mean, it could be a question for both of you to finish up with. Um, Joe, I mean, in regards to sort of we don't have any allowance within our guidelines that I'm aware of to use non-natives, but yeah, sorry, go, go uh, for yeah, it, and I guess what I was going to say that um, generally our, our agreements are, their objective is to restore native vegetation. So it doesn't allow for um, vegetating with non-natives. Um, I can see that like non-natives serve a habitat purpose or a protection purpose, but it's not um, in keeping with the natural vegetation structures there um i'll pass over to you andrew i think you've got some insights on that too yeah so it's a very good question and it all comes down to what your what your goal is in the landscape so if you're thinking of a windbreak you know your primary goal is to create a, sc a visual screen or a windbreak there's no reason that you can't introduce whatever it will best suit your soil type your aspect and your climate that said, the natives do have a resilience um, benef uh, capability, which if you're bringing in an exotic species, you don't really know how it's going to go. But so if you brought in peppercorns or apple pine onto your property and said, yep, I'm going to use those as my windbreak, we know they're going to work because they've been used now and they're actually now noxious weeds uh, at, in times. With the natives, you, you know that the plant, a grey box or a bimble box, um, is suitable to your, your soils. You put the acacia under, underneath you've got, and you've got a, a nice ground cover uh, and, and shrub layer to reduce the winds. You can create that windbreak using just natives as well. So it's all about 
the goal. And if you are trying to res restore a natural native ecosystem, well, obviously planting exotics is not the go. But if you want a spray, druffer, a spray buffer, for example, where you want to reduce uh, spray damage from um, cropping on one side of the paddock and to another paddock, you could use any number of different species for that that are, uh, that are suitable. So it's all about the goal. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. And I think at that point, we've just run over time. It's 1.30. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Andrew and Joe. I mean, there's a few other questions in there. There's one about the, um, the upcoming field day, and I'm going to queue to that in a second, actually. Um, but otherwise, those questions that we didn't get to, rest assured, um, I'll take the time to provide you with a, with a well thought out response um, via email going forward. So again, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Andrew. Such good information there that any and all land managers uh, can utilise to resolve resilience and uh, to restore resilience in our ecosystems. It's time to be part of the solution, people, and the blueprint is here for us to do it. The birds and bees will thank you for it, of course. And at this point, I will mention the um, the upcoming BCT and Land Care Field Day on the 24th of September, where Andrew uh, will be presenting the fruits of his labour in the flesh and in the field. And with spring just sprung, what better time to get out and bear witness to what good environmental stewardship can do. So I'm hoping at this point there is a flyer up on the screen. Uh, there's an email address and phone number at the bottom of the flyer. Otherwise, have a look at the events page on the BCT website for the details. And um, look, all else fails, just get in touch with me and I'll, I can point you in the right direction. And of course, we have another webinar on the 16th of November, this time on weed management and property planning. There's details to come, but you can register for the event uh, via the link in the chat window. I believe that's there. Link to the fourth webinar. Excellent. So again, thanks everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming along um, and I'll see you at the next one. And for now, that's it. Thank you very much. Ciao.